So hello everyone, uh, actually good afternoon. Uh, my name is Michele Bombotti, I'm an assistant research professor uh, at the University of Connecticut in the civil environmental engineering, and I also serve as the program manager for the technical systems for Brownfields program. And together with me here today, I have Professor Rupal Parekh uh, from the School of Social, uh, Social Work. And at the same time, she also serves as a community engagement coordinator and lead for, for the TAP program. So in our webinar today, uh, we'll be talking about, in general, our program. Uh, some of you may be already familiar with the program and the type of services that we offer to communities in New England. And then we'll go into a little bit of more of the specifics for the uh, our municipal assistance program for the, the spring of 2023. And at the end, we'll have some uh, some time for uh, for questions. Um, so if you have a question, uh, please put it in the chat or wait until the end, where you can unmute them, you know, yourselves, and uh, we can discuss a little bit more. Our program uh, is actually funded from the EPA to um, help with brownfield redevelopment across New England. So we serve all New England states. Um, uh, and essentially, our team uh, is a diverse team of experts. Um, our, our program director, Professor Kusoku, and myself are on the technical side of things with um, expertise on environmental remediation. And then, of course, we have Dr. Randy Mendez as a community liaison, Professor Perek, uh, our uh, social workers from the School of Social Work. But we also have a public health ex expert, Professor Wapai, and uh, Dr. Dixon um, from the Center of Land Use. Um, just to give you a brief overview of, of our program, first of all, you can find more resources on our website, including all the recordings from, from our webinars, information about, you know, the state, uh, you know, state resources and um, all the resources available to communities. Uh, a brief overview of our services. Uh, first of all, we do offer direct technical assistance to communities, which means that we talk with you one-to-one -one on different projects, on different technical projects, and I'll explain a little bit more about that. Our featured municipal assistance program, that is a program that actually started uh, back in um, 2018 when we were still a state initiative, and uh, we'll be talking a little bit more about that uh, since it's a unique program where we include students uh, in the in the program activities. Our continuing education program where we offer workshops, webinars, um, info sessions on different topics. And again, all this is available on our website. And of course, our community engagement program. And Rupal will be talking a little bit more about that towards the end of the of the webinar. Uh, of course, uh, we serve um, all types of entities, including municipalities, um, uh, cities and towns, regional planning commissions, nonprofits, and of course, we can work directly with you know states and tribes. Uh, we uh, distribute our services equally across across the New England states. However, however, we do prioritize environmental justice communities or communities that ha have been, uh, let's say, historically underserved so we make sure that uh, those communities will receive priority and of course the geographic diversity in terms of like serving uh, smaller um, towns as well uh, together with larger municipalities both in the rural and urban areas across New England. Our direct technical assistance uh, it just you know um, for your information, you can always reach out to us with specific questions. For example, if you have a question about uh, environmental site assessment, we can also, you know, uh, help you um, uh, navigate, you know, the, those highly technical documents, those lengthy documents that in many cases could be, you know, difficult to, to digest, especially when you have, for example, you know, a large complex site where you had multiple investigations done in, in the previous years. Our team can definitely, you know, put together a summary of those previous assessments and your remedial action plans or planning documents that you may have. Um, uh, one area of, of our activities is, of course, you know, reviewing Brownfield's proposals for EPA's program. Of course, you know, the the solicitation, the the, the program just closed, uh, you know, two weeks ago. But um, 
that would be again, you know, for next year, this is a program that is offered annually from uh, from by, by the EPA. So uh, every year we have um, we have our review process aligned with the deadlines of the EPA. At the same time, we offer access to resources like uh, different, you know, example proposals or you know um, templates for RFPs or RFQs. Uh, we are happy to provide that, and we're always always available to answer any questions that you might have. So you can always reach out to us through an email, and we can set up um, uh, set up a meeting to discuss any of you know any of like you know any brownfield projects that you might have. Our workshops and webinars on different topics. Again, everything is uh, on our website, uh, and we are actually soon uh, preparing to release a short course on uh, on EPA's uh, EJ screen. This is a screening tool, mapping tool, where you can actually, you know, uh, find demographic data for your community. Uh, so uh, stay tuned for that. And with that, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit more about our municipal assistance program and what this is about. So essentially, our program, the MAP program, is uh, how we how we structure the program is that we we do offer that uh, to municipalities, right? So we do open a request for proposals actually three times a year. And uh, we um, coordinate that through the activities of um, two courses that we have at UConn, two courses that are service-based learning courses on Brownfield redevelopment. Of course, you know the program is free of charge together with all of our services. All of our services are free of charge to, um, to communities across New England. And uh, the, the program essentially how it works is that you will be assigned a team of students that will be working with you on a particular project. And at the same time, the students will be receiving training um, and guidance, of course, from our team to help you with, with your project. So it works, you know, it's, it's a win-win type, uh, type of program because at the same time, you know, Communities are receiving, you know, help with a brand development, and at the same time, students are getting trained on have, let's say, hands-on education on brown on brownfield redevelopment. So, um, in terms of the types of projects that we support, and as I mentioned before, we offer the municipal assistance program three times a year, and that actually aligns with our semesters here at UConn, where um, we start with the fall semester from September to December, and that's where we actually support EPA Brownfield grant proposals through the course. Of course, you know, the deadline for that has passed, so we are now at the stage where we are actually accepting applications for the spring semester, which starts in January and goes until April. And of course, we're going to have also a summer session that starts from A and ends in August. During the spring and the summer sessions, we do offer uh, support with, uh, with respect to technical projects. And just to give you uh, an overview of the types of projects that we support, and that essentially, you know, the type of project aligns with what the community really wants to see, right? And where each community is with respect to, you know, um, the process of like brownfield redevelopment. If uh, you're starting, let's say from uh, from you know from step zero, where you're not really sure how many brownfields you have in the community, you haven't identified the site, uh, a brownfield inventory, right, would be a, you know a good a good start to have a database of sites that uh, you know that are brownfields within with you know within your community. And actually, this is a very helpful step, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, uh, when you're preparing, for example, if you're preparing to submit an EPA assessment grant proposal, this is a good first start to have a Brownfields inventory in your hands. Um, and then, of course, if you have uh, specific, you know, Brownfield sites that you might, you know, uh, we, we could collect data or uh, summarize previous um, site investigations for for uh, specific Brownfield properties. Uh, we could also support like um, uh, some um, scope of work for site investigations or conduct a, a gap analysis for again particular properties. You know, I'll, I'll be talking a little bit more about that 
uh, what, what this means and what the students can do for the community. And of course, site reuse planning, that is actually one of the most popular uh, projects uh, lately, uh, because I mean, it's, um, it also provides a visual for the development scenarios for a particular property. So again, I'll give a little bit more detail about that. And of course, community engagement, the community engagement materials and uh, community engagement plan for the, for the communities. Now, uh, when we actually talk about, you know, the technical projects, it could, they could be site specific, right? Specific to a particular property, right? As the data collection, right? As I mentioned, the data gap analysis, or they could be community wide. So, for example, you know, if you would like to do some like uh, community wide or area wide planning for a particular area of your town or a particular area, um, uh, or a corridor, we could also uh, discuss with you and see, you know, what makes sense for the students to do as well. So we have two options here, either work on specific, you know, brownfield sites or target, you know, multiple sites across the community. Now, uh, going into the specifics a little bit. Uh, so, and with respect to the site reuse assessments, right, or the site reuse planning, and as I mentioned, this is, you know, th these type of projects are actually becoming more and more popular. Um, so essentially what the students can do uh, when you have one or multiple brownfield sites in your community, you could, um, what, what we can do is uh, evaluate the different redevelopment scenarios for, uh, for those sites. And so when I mean evaluate re different redevelopment scenarios, I mean that you know our team will look at the site reuse holistically, right? With respect to first of all, you know what is the community surrounding the site, and uh, if we could also incorporate, if we have some community input and incorporate that into the uh, into the site reuse plan, that is even better. So essentially, we do research. Around, for the community with respect to the demographics, we look at nearby businesses and what is available nearby, uh, access to parks and you know, proximity to green space. Uh, we look at the zoning regulations, right? As one of the most important um, things actually, you know, what is that we can actually build there with respect to the zoning regulations. And we talk with the town if you know there is a plan to change, you know, uh, the, the zoning. Um, around the site so that we build this into the projections. Any other site restrictions, for example, um, if you know the site is on a floodplain or if they are wetlands, or if we have any remedial restrictions, uh, that is also something that uh, in many cases you we might not know that yet, depending on where the stage of the site is, where the stage of the of the of the redevelopment process, uh, if we have all, if we have all the site investigation documents and you know some information, the remedial action plan, perhaps we have that information and we built that in. And to give you an example, um, we had a project um, in uh, Claremont, New Hampshire, where there were uh, activity use restrictions on the site because of like previous previous remediation that has happened at the property. So we had to build that in and say, okay, well, you know, based on those restrictions, you know, the site cannot, let's say, support residential, residential development. So that we took into account when we were putting together that report of, um, of the site reuse assessment. And of course, you know, available infrastructure, you know, if there is, um, uh, public water, sewer, you know, available at the site, what is the kind of like the traffic assessment around the property and identifying perhaps, you know, gaps or um, future needs that are anticipated based on those redevelopment scenarios. So essentially besides, you know, besides the valuation of those different considerations that we have here, the students will actually, um, be able to develop uh, a rendering, actually multiple renderings for the site, depending on the 
on the site reuse scenarios and incorporate that into a report. So the deliverable with respect to that project would be a report summarizing all these different considerations plus the renderings. And it could actually be combined very well with um, community engagement workshops. And again, I wanted to bring this up here because uh, of that particular project that I talked about uh, in Claremont, where we did the site reuse assessment. Although we started with a site reuse assessment, we actually, um, I, throughout you know, the project, we talked with the town and we thought it was a good idea to, um, and to engage the community so that they can provide input on those preliminary site renderings. So we went there, um, we had great participation from the community. We had more than 40 people showing up in a Monday, uh, in a Monday evening, uh, a very hot Monday evening. <laughs> and uh, they were able actually, you know, to provide, they were provided their input with respect to, you know, the renderings that we had prepared and uh, they asked questions, technical questions about, you know, the contamination present at the site, you know, what is the future, um, what is the, you know, the future reuse and how this essentially aligns with what they want to see in their community and what is, let's say, that they, they don't want to see in their community. So uh, with the outcome of that, of that, um, in a workshop, we incorporated that into the site reuse assessment. So, uh, if you're interested in that, we could, you know, combine the site reuse assessment with the public workshop, where you know you also solicit the input from the community uh, with respect to the site development uh, scenarios. Uh, the data gap analysis or summary of investigations that is. Um, uh, mainly a very technical project where, and that would make sense when you have, for example, you know, a very complex site with multiple investigations in the past, uh, where you might um, want to say, okay, well, do we need further assessment or are we at the stage of like when we start, you know, the cleaning, uh, the cleanup process. So, uh, and that is actually, you know, that example here is from a site that we worked previously in Waterbury, Connecticut. And I mean, the students can review the documents, summarize the documents, um, and uh, then identify areas where you might need more assessment. And that is also helpful when you plan for, like, you know, again, finding funding for future, you know, assessment or cleanup processes to make sure that, you know, uh, we know exactly what is going on on the site. In many cases, again, having those many years of investigations. Right, previously, and you know, a lot of like uh, records and documents um, in your folders, uh, it might be useful to have kind of like a summary of what has happened before and what is the next step. So again, the deliverable for this project is essentially, you know, a technical report that summarizes that. Uh, it's not a, a very lengthy report. The idea is that you have this as a short summary. So it's going to be a couple of pages with um, uh, with some like figures identifying the areas where you might need more assessment. And just to mention here, I mean, we're not we're not environmental consultants, right? We're not we do not substitute the work that uh, you know, your consultants will do, you know, for you. The idea is that you know we provide technical assistance free of charge that will help you plan for the next step. So it's kind of like a, an intermediate step there. Brownfields inventories, um, those are also very uh, popular in terms of, uh, we've done a lot of inventories in uh, the past couple of years. Again, when we used to be, you know, a, a statewide initiative for the state of Connecticut only, but we've started also working with uh, different communities across New England to build inventories. Uh, the inventories are, again, you know, very helpful. Um, I mean, it, it goes beyond identifying sites and having the list of like addresses, right? So it's not gonna be um, just a list of addresses with sites where, oh, we know that those are brownfields. Um, it, it will be a database of sites that um, have their additional parameters, additional characteristics, such as, for example, 
uh, what is the acreage of the site, right? What is, you know, who is the owner? Uh, is the site, if it's, there is a private owner, is the site tax delinquent? What is the status? Uh, and of course, the most important is, you know, what is the environmental status? Where is the site at with respect to the site investigation process? Is the site at the stage of a phase one? Is the site of, at the stage of a phase two, phase three? Is the site at the stage where, you know, uh, we've started, let's say, remediation? So it's actually a Brownfoot's inventory. Uh, it's a tool for the community to plan for the next steps. It's a tool for the community to have this database and say, okay, well, you know, those are the sites and those are where, you know, this is kind of like where they are with respect to the development process. And besides the uh, just developing the database, what we've also worked on before is developing prioritization criteria and say, for example, and that, that could vary for each community. So it's not just a standard list of priority criteria saying, I don't know, perhaps, you know, uh, sites that are on the floodplain or sites that are uh, in a community uh, that is um, environmental justice community. Uh, it's a list of sites that um, it's, let's say, customized based on the town, based on the community and what is that they want to see. So, for example, we had um, prepared an inventory for the town of Athol in Massachusetts, and a big priority for the community was actually to be for the sites to be in the riverfront and in the downtown. So we incorporated that criteria together with some other criteria there to come up with a, a list of sites that would be an absolute priority for, for the town to redevelop. And um, just to give you an example of how we actually use that, uh, so we did the inventory during the spring semester, and then next fall, they prepared an EPA uh, Brownfield uh, community-wide assessment grant, where we used all the information we had from the inventory, including the priority sites, to put the narrative together. So if you're planning to apply for a community-wide assessment grant next fall, um, then it might be a good idea to have a brownfoot inventory done now so that you use that for next fall and you kind of like in, inform your your um uh your narrative there with the sites that uh you um you absolutely prioritize and the students will summarize um essentially everything in a report including the methodology including the data sources that they used and then uh, they could also have a small description for each site and especially for the priority sites it could be like you know a paragraph where they summarize exactly you know what they found so you can take that directly and use that for your um assessment grants and with that i'll pass it uh, to uh, RuPaul to talk about the community engagement. Thank you, Nefeli. <clears throat> As Nefeli mentioned, um, we are the community engagement team, which comprises of myself, social work faculty at the School of Social Work, and we also have two students that we work with, um, and those students are doing their field placement. We are a clinical program, so they do their field placement with TAB. Um, and since we've been working at TAB, we've been able to identify some key principles to effective and meaningful community engagement. So through our work, um, working with communities, particularly early on in the engagement process, we've learned that we really wanna focus on the lived experiences of the residents. Um, we wanna do this by encouraging opportunities to listen to different stakeholders and different community sectors. This could include listening sessions, focus groups, or developing communication materials that is inclusive and that involves members of the entire community. Um, we've seen that this can be accomplished often by identifying what we call community champions um, in different community sectors um, that are interested in hearing the needs and concerns of individuals in their neighborhoods. And I'll go more into this as we go through the presentation. This is just some of the key principles. Um, and then making sure that the, that the different community sectors um, that are interested in hearing the needs, um, the, making sure that the different community sectors have information that is accessible. Um, it basically gives people choices on how they want to engage this information. 
So is it online? Is it in person? So having a variety of engagement activities. Um, this can include online surveys, quick polling, suggestion boxes. What we see is that each community really needs a different set of engagement activities. So there isn't a one size fits all model here. Um, but the real goal is to give residents opportunities to share and discuss their ideas either online or in person. Um, making sure that the information is in plain language. So plain language is really at a fifth or sixth grade reading level. It uses active voice, short sentences. It omits excessive words and uses concrete and familiar words. Um, so we can help you here at TAB. Our team can help you develop materials that are in plain language, that are culturally competent, use cultural humility. That's kind of at the heart of social work. We know how to do that. Um, we wanna make sure that the information is as transparent as possible. Ultimately, um, we wanna meet um, the community where they're at. Um, and this could look different in different community sectors within one community. So again, we talked about how we can use um, community champions or change agents to share information in small circles or neighborhoods throughout the community, and this really does build trust. Um, we also use what we call a strength-based perspective. Um, so this is the glass half full rather than the glass half empty. So um, we help um, during community engagement activities to use this framework. So we ask questions like, what are the strengths and assets of your community? When was a time you felt your community was it as, at its best? What did you value most about your community? And what is the essence of your community that makes it unique and strong? Um, what we found is that these kinds of questions, this strength-based approach really build trust, um, get people involved early on, um, and can be really effective, um, particularly in the early stages of community engagement. Me uh, next slide, please. So many of you have um, hopefully seen the community engagement continuum, but if you haven't, um, this can be a really effective way to um, not only um, to engage the community throughout the redevelopment um, process. So as you can see, the degree of difficulty and in public impact increases as we worked um, as we work with the community. Um, so early on um, is often when we're providing a lot of information. So we're providing balanced objective information that the public should know and act on. Um, so this can come in different forms and I'll give you some examples. We do something called a Brownfields 101 or Environmental Justice 101 where we're providing information to the community. Um, then later on, we're seeking to um, obtain feedback through listening sessions, surveys, suggestion boxes, as I mentioned. This can be something effective. Um, and getting information from the community members in different community sectors. Um, then we want to start um, working together with the community. So this is working with the public to understand the issues and problems, and it can include identifying options um, to move forward. So Nifeli talked a little bit about um, some of the redevelopment scenarios that can um, be provided to different communities. So then we're working with the communities, collaborating with them, partnering with the community, um, seeking advice and innovations that become embedded as much as possible in decision making. And ultimately, the goal is to empower the community to actually make the final decisions about what redevelopment really looks like. So making the public, um, the making sure that the public are the are one of the players in implementing um, the project. Next slide. So community engagement could look different within each phase of redevelopment. And so um, one of the goals here is in the first uh, stage is really getting to know your community. So if we start working with you early on, which is really our goal, um, is really providing that education through Brownfields 101, uh, taking a look at the stakeholders, seeing who the stakeholders are, who are going to be the most influential, who are going to be less influential, what community groups do um, we want to engage with early on the process that may support some of our um, redevelopment um, um, uh, goals. 
uh, doing a SWOT analysis, and we can help you do um, both of these things, the stakeholder analysis, a SWOT analysis, looking at the strengths, weaknesses, and opportunities and threats in your community. Um, so that's when we work with you early on. That's where we would like to start um, working with communities. Um, and then um, we are at the planning stage, and um, this is really the due diligence. And I think Nefeli spoke about some of the technical activities. So we want to see how we can um, look at some of the technical activities and link them to engagement activities, as Nefeli mentioned, so we can really get the community involved in um, the site reuse assessment. Um, also, um, you know, how do we communicate risk, fatal flaws? Um, with the community and doing community engagement activities that are linked to some of the technical activities. And then once um, hopefully you have an EPA award, um, you know, are there community um, benefit agreements that need to be in place? Is there a displacement statement um, that needs to be communicated to the community? And once construction starts, how do you engage the community even at that stage? Um, making sure that the community is involved and understands on um, what is happening at the site. Okay, next slide. Okay, so I'm going to provide an example, a case study. Um, we worked with Bethlehem, New Hampshire, and some of the work that we did with them. So Bethlehem, New Hampshire, next slide. Um, is a fairly small community. Um, it has a population of 2,500 residents. Um, however, geographically, it's one of the largest towns in New Hampshire. Um, what we learned is that 22% of the population is over the age of 65. Um, the medium household income is 55,000 and approximately 9.4% of the population live in poverty. And so while working um, with that community with Bethlehem, next slide, we were able to um, um, provide some deliverables um, that made sense for their community. So what we, uh, learned is that um, most of the community are not really familiar with br what a brownfield is. And so um, we developed, and I'll get into some more details about um, uh, what comprised the Brownfields 101 presentation. Um, we also developed a targeted demographic infographic um, and a community engagement plan. Next slide. So the Brownfield 101 was really um, an opportunity uh, for them to have a presentation where they can utilize that to um, educate the community on the Brownfield's redevelopment process um, and really encourage citizens to think and reflect and ask questions and get involved um, in um, understanding more about what Brownfields are, um, acknowledging um, what brownfields are in, in New Hampshire, the impact of brownfields and actually the benefits of redevelopment, the redevelopment process. Um, this can be used, um, this um, presentation that we provided, um, Bethlehem can be used um, on their website. They can post it on their website. They can also use it for public presentations. Um, we also thought that this could be useful if they were using um, change agents, um, different motivated members in their community that can use um, this uh, presentation to educate um, members in their community sectors at you know, various organizations, neighborhood organizations, senior centers, community centers, um, so they can begin kind of involving the larger community about actually what a brownfield is and um, the benefits of redevelopment. Next slide. We also provided the community um, with an infographic. So they were interested in redeveloping um, the Sinclair, what was called the former Sinclair Hotel. And the infographic um, dives deeper into Brownfield's redevelopment with information on, um, like I said, their redevelopment plan for the former Sinclair Hotel. Um, it provides a tool that can be used to engage the community on a more personal level. So, as you can see, um, it's quite small here, but it was fairly, it was, we, we thought it was visually appealing. It summarizes important points and is tailored to emphasize how the needs of the community are being met through the redevelopment process. So, the infographic can be printed out and hung around town, passed out as flyers um, at community events, or shared digitally online and printed 
large scale to use at presentations. So this infographic information um, could really be beneficial for all, um, but um, we targeted this um, to the older adult population um, because we saw that that is a large portion of Bethlehem. So the infographic actually covers um, four domains of livability. So this is through the WHO age-friendly um, framework. And so it looks at residents' opportunities, economic growth, outdoor spaces, social participation. In each of these domains, we list how the redevelopment of the former Sinclair Hotel will benefit older adults in Bethlehem. For example, under the residential opportunities, we included the expansion of the Hill View apartment complex, um, which is now with the redevelopment going to include senior housing. So while this infographic serves as an example for one specific stakeholder, it could be modified to address the needs of any stakeholders in any community. So for example, another growing population in Bethlehem was their entrepreneur community. So we discussed with Bethlehem how we can actually tailor this infographic or how the infographic can be tailored um, to attract this population and the needs of this population. Next slide. So um, we also developed um, a community engagement plan um, for Bethlehem. So based on our conversations with Bethlehem stakeholders, um, we tailored a plan that really meets the needs of their communities. So for example, um, during the planning stage, um, when the community, when we actually really wanna get to know uh, the community, we suggested um, what we would call an intergenerational community visioning project. Um, and so we, um, we thought that using a community-based participatory method called photo voice um, could be really beneficial um, because this is an opportunity for community members, um, really multi-generational or intergenerational from different age groups to utilize photography to share stories um, about what the former Sinclair Hotel meant to them and what it can mean in the future um, to some of the younger generations. Um, so this can be a really engaging um, opportunity to get to know the community, get the community involved um, through um, you know, a workshop or an open house where people bring in different pictures of what the former Sinclair Hotel meant to them and how they see um, it in the future. Um, oh, um, there's also, um, as mentioned, Brownfields 101 to educate the community, tailored infographics, um, and various other activities. We also learned um, through our meetings that they have a uh, strong um, youth population in the schools. They've seen them involved in other community engagement projects in the past. So we talked about youth-driven community engagement um, activities and projects that could be um, beneficial to that community. And like I said um, earlier, um, we also talked about, you know, during the redevelopment phase, so when, once construction starts, how we can continue to keep the community involved through information booths, um, educating the community about, um, you know, what, what the construction may look like, um, if they might have traffic in a certain area for a certain period of time, keeping the community involved even at that stage of redevelopment. Okay, next slide. So some takeaways that we've learned so far, and, and I think that you know um, we'll continue to think about as we work with different communities, is there's really not a cookie cutter process. So it's not a one size fits all model. Each community is unique. And our team really um, wants to get to know each community and its needs, its strengths. Like I said, we use a strengths-based approach. Uh, so understanding the community's vision and the community stakeholder is key to helping create helpful community engagement strategies. And so we um, spend a lot of time with each community to try to help the community develop a vision if they don't already have a vision um, and to get to know the community so that we can develop tailored community engagement strategies. Um, and so it's also, like I said earlier, it's important to identify ways in which the community can feel a part of the decision-making. So um, early on, identify ways that make the process easier and can build trust. Um, 
We are also uh, currently exploring web-based tools to develop interactive community engagement tools for each community. So um, this would provide a menu of online um, and in-person engagement activities each community can tailor um, as they work with us um, for their project and share with their communities. So um, we hope that we can have some more online engagement uh, tools um, and services for communities that um, engage our services this spring. Thank you, Rupal. And um, one one more type of project that we actually um, did for for one community in Bridgeport, and that also has to do with the community engagement materials, was to develop a story map. And actually, we had um, Katie, you know, your your student Rupal and uh, Dr. Mendes, you know. They were both working on that from both from a community engagement perspective, but also from the technical perspective to essentially put together a story map for a particular particular brownfield site. Um, and uh, you can actually uh, see this in, uh, in our website. It really gives you an overview of what has happened at the, you know, at the site before. Uh, and also gives the community an understanding of the site history and what is the future vision and why is it important. So that is, you know, also something, another type of project that we could support through, you know, through the community engagement um, uh, program. And I now back to some of the logistics uh, who can actually uh, apply to, you know, receive our services. Well, you know, all the entities essentially, you know, municipalities, right, towns or or cities, like you know, local government and regional planning commissions, our development agencies are also eligible to apply, nonprofit organizations, and of course, uh, states and tribes. Uh, so we don't, I mean, we don't work with private entities, uh, but uh, essentially, you know, the entities outlined here from the public sector or nonprofits, uh, we would, uh, you know, uh, definitely, you know, offer our services, which are again free of charge. Now, uh, our deadlines and how to apply for um, for the municipal assistance program for this spring. So our application is uh, currently open. So our RFP request for proposals is uh, currently available on our website. So if you see that link on the bottom of the screen here, and I'll also make sure to put it in the chat later, this will bring you to our uh, application. Our application is uh, fairly simple. Um, we have this as a five minute you know, application where you mainly um, submit your contact right, your, the organization name, and what is, of course, you know, the status of your entity to so make sure that you're eligible to receive our services. And of course, what is the type of project that, um, that you're interested in? Uh, so from the, so there's the menu of services right there from the Brownfields inventories to the community engagement uh, materials where you can select um, the, the type of project that you're interested in. The um, deadline to uh, be um, uh, included uh, for the municipal assistance program for spring uh, 2023 is currently December 14th. Uh, and I'm like, December 14th, well, that's actually next week. Well, we might be giving an extension uh, about a week or so, but you know, keep this in mind if you like, again, to like to uh, apply for our program, uh, you know, try to you know uh, apply as, as soon as possible. As we will be starting, you know, evaluating the applications after you know the December 14th deadline. And in terms of uh, the commitment of the applicant, essentially, you know, the only things that we ask for is first of all, you know, to have a contact person, right? Somebody that will be the lead for the project and meet with our team and the students be available essentially, you know, to have meetings with our team uh, frequently during the, you know, during the project. And I mean, in many cases, those meetings might be virtual, right? Besides, you know, some of the site visits or uh, we try to at least be um, to visit your community at least once or twice to during the during a project, but then, you know, all the other meetings could be, you know, through, um, it could be virtual. 
and then of course you know provide any available resources for the project any previous documents any information that you might have and you know share those with with our team now in terms of the anticipated schedule so essentially our semester starts uh mid january where um where the students right will be introduced into the program i mean uh they know about brownfield development because the students that we have for the spring semester have already taken the brownfield course in the fall semester so they have they have the necessary background to start working on the on the project right away so in january we'll be having an introductory uh, meeting with the students where uh, you will be assigned a team of students and for the spring semester is usually one or two students depending on the project and essentially you know you can we can meet with them you know either virtually or or in person and then du during the you know the project we have you know the virtual meetings as needed uh, make sure we have a site visit it's usually in the beginning beginning kind of like early in the semester around February or March uh, where the students would have they would be familiar with the project during you know from the resources that you provide and then we do the site visit so that they actually you know see the community see the brownfield sites that you know they will be working on and of course, you know, the final report um, and the deliverable and also, you know, a, a final presentation, um, it's usually around April. Now that, uh, that timeline sometimes um, varies. It actually depends on the project and the complexity of the project. So if there is a, a you know, very complex, let's say, you know, Brownfield site where we do, you know, the site reuse assessment or, or the community engagement plan, that might uh, take a little bit longer. So, I mean, although the students, I mean, will take the course, right, and that is from January to April, we know that in many cases it might need additional work from our team that could be, let's say, um, uh, could be after the semester. So keep that in mind that for some of the projects, my, they might run a little bit longer, depending again on the complexity. And of course, our contacts, uh, you know, feel free to, you know, reach out to myself, you know, Rupal or Randy anytime with, you know, I have our emails here. Of course, everything is available on our website. Uh, and, you know, again, you know, I would like to, you know, to thank you for, for taking the time uh, to come to the webinar today. And with that, I'd like to open the discussion uh, for any questions that you might have. Stop sharing and see if we have any questions in the chat. I don't see anything in the chat, but feel free to, you know, unmute yourselves and just, you know, if you have any questions, let us know. And let me put in the, the link for the application there too. Hi, this is Joe Callahan. Uh, I'm working on um, on behalf of the town of Avon, Mass. So, what level of support do you provide? I mean, how extensive is it? You know, where's the limits? I, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, if we have a, a for instance, where we're interested in uh, the Brown Fields inventory uh, that you talked about. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of Brown Fields sites. So, how how much support can you provide to us? <clears throat> That's an excellent question, Joe. Uh, so it's essentially that depends on the project. I mean, for us, and since you mentioned the Brownfields inventory, um, of course, you know, identifying all the sites within, you know, especially if you have a larger municipality, right, and identifying all the sites could be challenging, right? So we have an approach of like how to identify sites within, the, you know, a uh, community. Of course, we would work with you to actually, you know, inform some of that, you know, that identification of sites. Of course, we'll be looking at public lists. We'll be looking at different lists that are available. Um, our students will go through the mass DP release database of sites that have, you know, reported, let's say, previous, you know, releases. So, and they 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 will check if they have if you have brownfield sites. Uh, there from that list, uh, but uh, 
I mean, essentially the level of support would be, um, would go to an extent where, you know, we um, go through all the resources that we have available, right? And then we summarize, you know, all the findings of the report in the deliverable that you can, you know, later on use for, for you know, for your community. But of course, you know, our team, you know, will be available to answer any specific questions, you know, plan for next steps in terms of, so besides, you know, the Brownfields inventory and planning for the next steps of the redevelopment or perhaps identifying funding sources, that is also part of, you know, of the support that we provide to the towns. So it's not going to be strictly, let's say, oh, you have that deliverable, that inventory now and, you know, we're, we're not, you know, uh, we're not getting involved with anything else. So it will be beyond that. So thank you. Yeah, uh, I anticipate this to be a, a dynamic, dynamic thing to uh, probably progress into the next level, like, like you talked about after identifying what the most uh, uh, likely brownfield sites are to redevelop in, in a community. So thank you for this presentation. You're very really welcome. And I mean, just to add to that, to add to that, uh, we've seen communities where you know they participate into the you know the MAP program, the municipal assistance program, you know, for one semester, and then they come back and say, okay, well, you know, the next step is now this and this. So we have communities where we work with them, you know, for years, uh, step after step, you know, when it comes to to brownfields. Um, I have a question about, we're trying to identify whether or not a specific um, site, oh, I'm sorry, my, my name is Mel Jenks, I'm with the town of Middleborough, um, is in fact a brownfield site. Um, we're trying to decide, we have an assessment which was done already, and it seemed to indicate it was not very dirty, so we're not even sure if we're qualified for the EPA funding, and I'm wondering which kind of technical assistance would assist us with that. That's a great question. Uh, actually, that could go, I mean, um, under our direct technical assistance services. So we can talk about this, you know, we can set up a meeting and talk about the site and see if, you know, the site meets the eligibility uh, under EPA's definition of a brownfield. Uh, in general, we use EPA's definition of um, a property that is potentially contaminated, right? But at the same time, is also either abandoned or underutilized. Uh, but of course, there are other issues um, associated with that. So I would definitely, you know, uh, encourage you to reach out so that we set up a meeting, see the property, look at the documents, the records, and we, you know, we take it from there. But for that, you don't have to apply to our municipal assistance program. You can directly reach out to our team. Let me put my email here so that you have it. Uh, and we set up a meeting to discuss one to one. Great, thank you so much. Um, and just one more, one more question. Um, we actually have an existing community engagement plan in place, um, but we have struggled with implementation of these plans in the past in terms of participation. And I'm wondering, is there a component to the community engagement in terms of like actually getting the community to engage? That's a great question. Yeah, you know, um, I think we also we. Um, suggest communication strategies as well as um, engagement strategies and activities. So um, a lot of communities are struggling with that. So this is this is not the first time I've heard that. So um, yeah, we're happy to discuss communication strategies, um, you know, how to actually get the community involved. That's actually part of the engagement process. So um, yeah, ha happy to assist with that. So please do reach out and I, I can also put my email in the chat. Thanks a lot. I'm also really appreciative of the service. Have a couple of minutes left. Uh, if uh, you know you have any more questions, you know, let us know. Um, I don't see anything else in the chat here.